It's amazing what the anointing does. I know a lot of people with ability, but they don't have much ministry. Let me say that again. I know a lot of people with ability, but they don't have much ministry because the anointing turns ability into ministry. See, there are a lot of people with some big churches and their abilities, powerful, but they never minister because they don't have an anointing in their life, anointing coursing through their veins. And the Lord spoke that to me because when he called me to preach, I said, Lord, I, I don't even have any ability. He said, but the anointing will create ability and turn it into ministry. Because I don't care how good you are. You know, we all want to preach good. We worry more about our delivery than actually what we're saying. Because we want to, like I said, I call it the old um, gospel way of ringing the bell. So we can be called preachers, preachers. Glory to God. I mean, you can preach to preachers. You got something to say. At least that goes in that, that circle of ministry. But I realize that uh, I've heard some great ministers, but had no anointing. They had great ability. Then I've had some people that couldn't hardly talk too good, but the anointing turned that ability into such powerful ministry. And without it, there's nothing, because I see this in Paul's revelation, in that Paul always called Jesus Christ Jesus. And Peter, James, and John called him Jesus Christ. Though those disciples, those first, and they dealt with the person of Jesus, and Paul dealt with the message of Jesus. So he always said, very seldom Paul ever said Jesus Christ. He said Christ Jesus. And for centuries we've been preached on the person of Jesus, which we need to know. But we never knew what he said. We knew what he wrote, or you know, he spoke, but we never knew what he preached. But Paul came preaching his message. And if you look through all his epistles, he always, most nine times out of ten, he said Christ Jesus because he realized that the message is just as effective as the person, if not more. Because Jesus said that they really didn't do the greatest works until Jesus' message came forth. While he was there, they touched a few, but when he was gone, they touched the world. So that's an anointing, turning ability in the ministry. And he, I've said this many times before, he didn't, Go to ORU to pick them boys. In my, in my opinion, he went down to the bayous and picked them Jewish cages, what he did. <laughs> Those fishermen that talk like that. And I'm going to throw you something right now, you know what I mean? Because adaptability is the key in touching a city. Jesus was very adaptable. You know, he, and Paul was adaptable. He was in season, out of season. He... Whatever, wherever he was, he could adapt to that situation. See, because sometimes you get yourself in a bind. If you don't know how to adapt to that situation, it's very hard to minister to that individual, which reminds me of, I have a Cajun heritage of a friend of mine named Boudreau and Fontenot <laughs> and Gautreau. And they won some tickets to the 1996 Summer Olympics. So Boudreaux said, man, I got I, I, I to call my friend Fontenot. I, I, man, I, I got to call Gautreau, you know, and tell him maybe they want to come with me. You know what I mean? So he called him two boys. That's his first cousin, his second cousin. For you people in Texas, that's cousin. <laughs> and Boudreaux said, I'm going to throw you something there. Fontenot, man, I got some three tickets to the summer limit. You want to go? Oh, shy, bon Dieu, yeah. <laughs> he said, you think Gautreaux want to go? Oh, sacré, yeah. Man, let's go. So, man, they get on that plane. They fly over down there, Atlanta. They start to walk up to the gate. Boudreaux look in their pocket. He said, my God, I done forgot the ticket. <laughs> and Fondo said, what's the matter with you? You know how much money it's going to cost for us to get these tickets? I'm going in there. And Boudreaux said, man, how you going to go, Fondo? How you going to go? He said, I'm going to figure out something. So, man, Fondo look around. He see a shop. He go over there, buy him a white shirt. Buy him some white shorts, some white shoes. He pick up a basketball. He go to that front gate. And the man was from Texas. And he said, USA, basketball. He said, come on in. <laughs> Down on the other side of the fence. Found the way. Goldtrust said, man, I can do that too. So he go down there and buy him a white shirt, some white shorts, some white shoes. He look around, he see this javelin. 
laying on the ground. He walked up to that man and he said, USA team, track, track and field. Man, he said, come on in. Now, Boudreaux said, ain't that something? I'm the one got the ticket and I got to stay outside. <laughs> man, I got to do something fast. So he go down to that store, he buy him that white shirt, he buy him them white shorts and them shoes. He look around, he don't see nothing. He said, well, what I'm going to use? And he see a roll of barbed wire. He pick up that barbed wire and he walked to that man. And he said, USA, fencing. <laughs> That's adaptability. <laughs> he got in. And the key to it is to get in, to adapt to the situations that you're in. <laughs> Numbers chapter 22. I figured I'd start off like Mac. I like the way Mac started off. Oh, my God. I want to start reading Numbers 22, verse 18. Read a few scripture. Balak is worried about Israel taking everything he's got. So he goes into, gets hold of a greedy preacher, a greedy prophet. He said, if I can get him to curse him, bless God, I, I, I can take care of this situation. So verse 18 says, And Balaam answered and said unto the servants of Balak, If Balak would give me his house full of silver and gold, I cannot go beyond the word of the Lord my God to do less or more. Now therefore I pray you, tarry ye also here this night, that I may know what the Lord will say unto me more. Now that's a lie right there because he got money on his mind. God came unto Balaam at night and said unto them, if the men, underline that, if the men, that's the most important three words in that verse. If the men come to call thee, rise up and go with them. But yet the word which I shall say unto you, thou, thou shalt thou do. And Balaam rose up in the morning and saddled his ass. Now that blew me away the first time I read that. I said, sacre, look what's in that box. <laughs> because you see, when you raise Catholic, you don't think that's in there. <laughs> Saturday's ass. Because <laughs> you got to understand, if you're from New Orleans and you've been raised Catholic, they tell you don't read the Bible. And when I heard that, I said, Kathy, did you see what's in that Bible? And man saddled his ass. <laughs> Kathy said, don't say that. I said, I didn't say that. He said that. <laughs> that you know, we're not used to that. Now, verse 22 always bothered me, and God's anger was kindled because he went. And I thought, well, Lord, you told him he could go. No, he didn't tell him he could go. He said, if the men come to call. They didn't come to call. He got up and went over there by himself. He had money on his mind. See, the men didn't call him. And God thought, boy, you're a prophet and you want to curse my people? You ought to have enough God. Just, you know I ain't going to believe that. But yet, so he disobeys God twice in his heart once because he wants to go. Second, the men didn't come. God's anger was kindled because he went and the angel of the Lord stood in the way for an adversary against him. Now he was riding up on his ass. Whew. And his two servants were with him. And the ass saw the angel of the Lord <laughs> standing in the way. And his sword drawn in his hand. And the ass turned aside out of the way. <laughs> you got to do that sometimes. <laughs> And went unto the field. I'm reading the Bible. I don't know what you're thinking. I'm reading the Bible. <laughs> and Balaam smote his ass. Cool. To turn her into the way. That's what I used to do when mama tried to beat me. 
I turned the other way. But the angel of the Lord stood in the path of the vineyards, a wall being on this side and a wall on that side. And when the ass saw the angel of the Lord, she thrust herself unto the wall and crushed Balaam's foot against the wall, and he smote her again. Twice he done hit this ass. <laughs> and the angel of the Lord went further stood in a narrow place where there was no way to turn either to the right hand or to the left. And when the ass saw the angel of the Lord, she fell down under Balaam. And Balaam's anger was kindled and he smote the ass with a staff. Now he's hitting this thing with a stick. And the Lord opened the mouth of the ass. And she said, this was a she-ass. <laughs> I'm just reading the Bible here. You people watching my television, it ain't my fault I didn't write this. <laughs> and she said unto Abelam, What have I done unto thee, that thou hast smitten me these three times? Now notice the intelligence of Balaam. And Balaam said unto the ass, Because thou hast mocked me. I mean, this is a Mr. Ed talking ass. <laughs> now, what would you do if that happened to you? I'd run the other way. <laughs> but this prophet got greed on his mind so fast. That's the only thing he can hear. Is the mouth of an ass. Because thou hast mocked me and I would there were a sword in my hand, for now would I kill thee. And the ass said unto Balaam, Am not I thine ass? <laughs> Upon which thou hast ridden ever since I was thine unto this day? Was I ever wont to do so unto thee? And he said, Nay. Then the Lord opened the eyes of Balaam and he saw the angel of the Lord standing in the way and his sword drawn in his hand and he bowed down his head and fell flat on his face. And the angel of the Lord said unto him, Wherefore hast thou sm smitten thine ass these three times? So notice the angel has got the ass on his mind. <laughs> Behold, I went out to withstand thee because thou was Thy way is perverse before me. And the ass saw me and turned from me these three times. Unless she had turned from thee, surely now also I had slain thee and saved her life. And saved her life. Go back. Whew. To the part where he smites. Verse 27. When the ass saw the angel, the Lord fell down unto Balaam. And Balaam's anger was kindled. He smote the ass with a staff. He kicked it first, hit it. The title of my message this morning is Don't Kick the Donkey. <laughs> and I'll let you interpret it the other way. <laughs> Don't Kick the Donkey. It's the vehicle that God has given you to get you from point A to point B. Don't kick the donkey. Yeah, but I don't want to be an ass. Everybody wants to be a thoroughbred. Everybody wants to be a quarter horse. But you notice you don't pack down thoroughbreds. God needs some mules. Mules bring the supply to the camp. Some of you are not even mules. But notice that he gave mules big ears. He that hath an ear, let him hear what I'm saying. <laughs> I'd like to be a mule, but I'm not even, I'm a donkey. Well, you're the most sure-footed animal ever lived on the planet. And you can walk in rocky, craggy places. 
and a thoroughbred will slip. But that donkey will walk up that mountain, around that mountain, even inside of it, and back down and give you a safe journey. And we wonder sometimes why God didn't make us thoroughbreds, quarter horses. Because he needs the whole situation because there's a camp of people that need to be ministered to. And I, find, I found in my ministry when I first got saved, I didn't realize just how insecure ministers are. Now, I've been in 948 churches. I haven't found many secure ministries or ministers. When I was a sinner, I learned years ago to never compromise myself because that's all I got. The minute you compromise yourself, you will compromise the rest of your life. You need to be what you are. And not be that other person. Now you can have peers and say, my God, I wish I was Billy Graham. That's a thoroughbred. But that's all right. You're still in the camp. I couldn't get over the insecurity that when ministers, like if another preacher would come to downtown to build a church, and this guy had, I don't know, 400, and the town had 5 million people, he was worried. That bothered me. Or when I would get amongst traveling ministries, they would criticize other ministers who were doing well. And I thought, why? You should shout that God has anointed this ability in the ministry to the world. I can't be a Kenneth Copeland. I'd love to be. I wish I could teach like him. I can't. So I've never tried. I wish I could be a shambok. Won't somebody, won't somebody run around this tent some? I wish I could sweat like T.D. Jakes. <laughs> My God, I'd like to sweat like that man. But I can't. I can sweat a lot, but not like that. So I decided not to beat my vehicle because it's taken me from point A to point B. And I would not let jealousy come in my life. I love walking through the fields of other ministries. It's wonderful to me. Not long ago, I was at Pastor J.C. Hass's church in Winston-Salem. I walked through his field. He allowed me to walk through his field that he had planted. That was an honor. I wasn't trying to pick flowers for myself because that field was precious to him. I've walked in many of your fields. When Jerry told me about his school of evangelism, we went over there. I was excited about that. I didn't say, well, bless God. How? Why don't you give me a school, God? Because you're going to teach them to talk like that. That's why. <laughs> no, I was glad. It was wonderful to walk in his field and see how he talked about it. That blessed me. It blesses me to see your dream come true. Because you see, if your dream comes true, my dream comes true too. I may be the water boy on the team, but that's okay. You need me because you need water. In other words, don't kick the donkey or interpret it your way. See, when the donkey you're riding suddenly refuses to move, don't kick it or beat it. Instead, get off and look for the angel in the road. Because sometimes we can't see. Because we don't want to see. We're blinded by ambition. We're blinded by power. God is looking for a person superior to power instead of a person driven by power. Balaam was driven by power of money. But the ass was just doing his job and was saving the man's life. So I realize when I am doing something for God, if I run into something or I can't get something to work, I get off my vehicle and look for the angel in the road. Because God may be trying to direct me 
But what I'm trying to do is direct God. How many times you've told the Lord, if you would listen to me, this would work. <laughs> but no, why you got to do it the hard way? Just listen to me. Walking, you know, it, it's amazing. When, many times when you feel farthest from the truth, you are very close to it. There's been times when I didn't feel, when I don't feel God is when I'm as close as I can be to him because I'm walking strictly by faith and not by sight or senses. See, so I love walking through other people's fields. I had the honor, Brother Harold Nichols asked me for seven years to come to this church. I made it in January of this year. And he was so excited that I had come. But what he didn't realize I was in awe of his field because I believe that's where your first meeting was preached. I said, look at this field. I want to be like Harold and Lou Nichols. I went to Israel with them people and had to tell him to slow down because he was wearing me out. I'm a lot younger than him. I don't look it, but I'm a lot younger. And them and here and Sister Lou and Harold just going down. I mean, they're just going. And I'm going, my God, man. And they hold hands. And they've been married for a good while. And I said, look at the love between these people. This is a blessing of God. So I learned from that. And I got in his church and he said, Brother Jesse, service is yours. Do what you want. This man, Pastor Hash, he says, now Jesse, you know us here and we know you. The service is yours. I thank you that you didn't judge me for what other asses have done. Don't shock, don't be shocked. You watching my television, pick your coke up off the floor. I know it. One of the hardest things for ministries is to be judged by someone else. Now, I know you got to protect this pulpit, but it's very unfair to cause a judgment to come on somebody that you don't even know because somebody ripped you off stole from you, which traveling ministries have done that and vice versa. We all got our little finger pointing things. I said, judge me for who I am. I won't hurt you, man. I don't want nothing you got. I just came here because the vehicle brought me here. And I want to be a blessing to you. And I don't remember my offerings because people tend to want to book that way. That guy gave me a good offer. I think I'm going to go down there and get... No, no. That has nothing to do with it. It has to do with my destiny. But sometimes I say, God, why do you want me to go down there? He said, because there's an angel in the road. There's a donkey that is pre preventing this guy from getting killed. And he can't hear me and he can't hear the donkey. Maybe he'll hear you. I'm trying to save him. And then there's times I've wanted. I've pulled my vehicle. Come on, let's do it this way. No, no, you got to follow the path of God. Rethink your route and mission. Donkeys haven't been given big ears for nothing. They can hear. We used to go see a preacher when we ought to go hear a preacher. I hear people say, I wish I could have seen Jack Cole. You should have heard him. Faith cometh by hearing. See, don't kick your donkey. Jesus never kicked his donkey. Never. He received the vehicle that God gave him to get him to Jerusalem. See, on his mother's side, he's named Jesus, but on his father's side, he named Emmanuel. On his mother's side, he's born in Bethlehem, but on his father's side, he's from Jerusalem. There's two sides here that you have to realize. Rethink your route and mission. Find out where you're going. And I found out something else. Most ministers don't know where they're going, so you're not going to know when you get there. You may have already passed where you're supposed to go. <laughs> but if you don't know, that's the thing that always bothered me. From this small, I knew what I was going to do. I was going to be a musician. I was going to make money because I came from a poor family. Then when I went to the church, they were worse off than we were. Yet they said they believe God. Now you got to understand a heathen boy, all he can think is heathenism. So he only goes by what he sees. 
you know, he can't hear because his ears are in faith line. Only message he can get is, come unto me, all you that labor and heavy laden. Because that Holy Spirit's touching him, trying to get that person into the kingdom of God. That's why they don't understand this faith stuff. Well, a lot of people don't understand faith stuff even after they're saved because the ears hadn't been lined with what God wants in there. They're plugged up with wax. And the wax is the wax of tradition and experience. I tried to cast that devil out, but he wouldn't go. Well, you know, that guy tried that and it didn't work. What? Jesus said he gave you power and authority over all devils. You don't give up. I saw Brother Corbin cast the devil out of a prayer. He didn't give up. Man, that person was spitting, screaming, and hollering. And he all of a sudden turned around and said, let's go. Now my mind said, hey, that devil's still here. But not according to Brother Copeland. He done rebuked it. I'm out of here. Let's go. So I just followed him. Okay, I'm with you. And I heard that devil. I said, hey, Jack, leave a possessed. Jack, I'm out of here myself. I'm going, Brother Copeland. <laughs> Yet when we got back that night or the next night, there's the girl sound standing in her right mind and her husband shouting and praising God. And Kenan went, I went, yeah, look at her. He had that look on his face. Didn't you believe it? I said, yeah, yeah, I believe it. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? You're not moved by what you see. You're moved by what you believe. So write this one point down. When the donkey you're riding suddenly refuses to move, don't kick it or beat it. Instead of get off and look for that angel in the road. Sometimes we don't hear God because we want to do what we want to do instead of what God wants to do. Most of the things God's told me to do, I didn't want to do. I am a man that shuns publicity. And I, you know, you know me since I've been preaching with Brother Copeland. I don't mean this in an arrogant sense or egotistical way. Before I met Brother Copeland, I was preaching in the biggest churches in America. Different denominations. I don't mean that arrogantly. God opened those doors for me. I don't know. He just did. You know, and it's like people think Josh Myers just came up on the scene. That girl's been out there trudging that ground for over 20 years. I hear some preachers. And I say, Are you jealous? What's the matter with you, man? Every soul should get saved. Every person gets delivered through a ministry. is a star in your cap. That's one person closer to the return of the Lord Jesus Christ. Come on, let's get on the team instead of dragging back. But then I realize I'm talking to a donkey sometimes. <laughs> and, it's, and it's insecurity. And it may have started when you was little. You know, when you're short, you can get insecure quick because they call you little all the time. I was called Little Jesse. I'm the smallest one in my family in terms of height. My brothers, I got two brothers bigger than I am. And they always look down on me. I don't like that. So, you know, you got to fight because somebody's going to push you. So you want some of me? I mean, if you got to beat his kneecaps up, at least you get to him. <laughs> I want to be as big as Mike Barber. Every time I hug Mike Barber, I think, my God, give me a body like that. He said, I can't. You'd kill people. Yes, I would. <laughs> I would like to just be, his t-shirt would make a nightgown for me. <laughs> He's called Triple X. I said, whoa, my big old four X, I mean big shirts. And Kathy knows it bothers me sometimes, but she puts on my t-shirt, my t-shirt looked big. She said, well, look, you look big. But my wife loves me, you understand? <laughs> I said, thank you, Kathy. She was, yeah. <laughs> so, so a lot of times when I thought I was farthest from the truth, I was the closest to it. I, most of the stuff God told me to do, I didn't want to do. God told me to go on PTL. He didn't tell me he was going to judge it. I went on and gave him money one year in advance. They said, you're the first preacher ever done it. I was on it a week and the whole thing caved in and it was like pulling a plug on on a bat there goes the money and people said you're on PTL 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 and God said I want you on PTL I said it's going down Satan why didn't you tell me you was gonna judge this place he said if I would have you wouldn't have went on why do you want me on cuz you got joy do I look like I got joy you know, you can argue with God sometimes. <laughs> he said, yeah, joy's in you, Jesse. Minister. I was going to Charlotte and ripped Tammy's eyelashes off her head. <laughs> I was mad. 
I was wrong. I was kicking my own donkey. I was kicking myself. You stupid, stupid. But that's why God wanted me. I said, God, why, Lord? Send somebody else. Just send somebody else. Look, I'll be satisfied to cut grass for you. I didn't call you to cut grass. I gave you a vehicle, Jesse. Don't beat it. Don't kick it. Go with it. Now, I'm going to just tell you some of my, there's some wonderful ministers in here. I've walked in their fields. I've had the honor of preaching for Happy and Jeannie Caldwell. I've walked in that field called agape. That means everything you touch is God's love everywhere. That's an honor that a person would allow me to do that. It's an honor. It's a blessing. I watch and I learn and I perceive and I pick up things because I can use those things. I'm a man that believes in information. I love information of any kind. The A A and E, the biographies on television, I like that. Discovery, I like that channel. I can tell you what baboons do at night. (laughs) I watch them. I have learned the monkey language. I proved it at the New Orleans Audubon Zoo. I had gorillas mad and chimpanzees mad and baboons mad. And the head, the man at the head of the zoo came and said, we got to get you out of here. You are talking to these things. Yeah. Where you learn these things? I said, the Discovery Channel. I had a male baboon so mad because I was making eyes at his woman. You ought to see him. Ha, ha. He was hot, man. But the female baboon was like, Kathy pulling me by the arm, come on, get out of here. I had a gorilla so mad he's beating his chest in. Oh, silverback. Because I was looking at a woman. I know what, I know the signs. They had to get me out of the zoo. They said, don't let him come in here. I learned some things. I want to learn. I get around Kenneth Copeland and and Gloria Copeland. I learned some things. I'm proud of these two people. They pulled me out of a ditch of life. It blessed me. I had the honor of preaching in the same church with Sister Gloria. I was preaching in the morning. She was preaching at night. We was in South Africa. So, man, I got up. I said, my God, you need to come tonight. Gloria Copeland, I'm telling you, get ready. So I told Gloria, she said, oh, God, maybe they they might be disappointed. No, they ain't going to be disappointed because she's got revelation. And she gets that Bible and she got enough of them. I mean, they're everywhere. (laughs) She got a bunch. She ain't going to miss this word of God. She likes her messages so much that if she misses a, a verse, she'll go, wait, wait, wait. Let me read this one, too. And it's not only good for her, it's good for me. It's just a blessing. My own son-in-law says, my God, man, I can understand this lady. I said, you mean you hadn't understood me? He said, I don't want to answer that question. You're my boss. So if your vehicle seems to be stuck in the road, get off and look for the angel of God. Look for him. Listen. You need faith in your head as well as faith in your heart. I'm sitting on my plane. I have a sign in there. God's been good to Jesse. Anybody riding that thing, they see that all the way going and all the way coming back. I meditate on that. I say, boy, God's been good. I am an American man. Do you like overseas? No. I can smell it, American airspace. I would stay in America the rest of my life. I'm an American. And God told me, he said, look, I want to send you over. I said, listen, send Jerry. <laughs> I'll back him. I don't believe in reinventing the wheel. You want to go to Kenya? I'll give, I'll give money to go to Kenya. I don't want to go to Kenya. <laughs> but Jerry's got a vision for Kenya. 
Got a nation on his mind. Praise God, man. Get behind. Yeah, it's fine with me. Glory to God. Then Jerry says, I want you to come preach for me in Kenya. Ugh. Why? They don't eat like we eat. They don't smell like we smell. I don't like hugging people with manure in their hair. Them people wear manure in their hair. I think, whoa, whoa. I believe in taking a bath at least once a day, twice. I've been taught that way. Be clean. You can be, we poor, but bless God, we got water and soap. But different cultures do different things. I'm an American man. Ireland's calling for me. It's happening. I thought, oh, I, don't, I would just rather stay here. And the Lord spoke to me. You love this plane? I ain't looking for another plane. I said, yes, God, I thank you. He said, can it cross the big pond? No, but I don't want it to cross the big pond. <laughs> I do. Now, what is my odds of meeting the president of Cessna? Zero. Until I go to Winston-Salem, North Carolina to preach for you, Pastor Hash. My God, the president of Cessna Corporation flies in. And I citation seven. Seize my plane. He said, boy, that's, that's a good plane. And yeah, bless him. God is setting me up. I'm being set up. It's the vehicle. Do I want to go? I know I want to beat. Get yourself back to America. But <laughs> I said, I'm totally satisfied. He said, I, thank you. I appreciate you being like that. But I got to do some things. He said, can you believe like I believe? I said, yeah. He said, fly to Wichita. I said, well, I'm going to Hutchison to preach with Jerry. He said, go to Wichita. Make an appointment. Call him. Tell him you're coming to look at new planes. I said, but, I, 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 but, but I, I'm satisfied. He said, listen to me. So I had Jack call Cessna Corporation. Set up lunch and dinner. I said, I want to see the Citation 10. And I want to see the Citation 7. And I want to see the Citation Ultra. Yes, sir. I went home. I put on the finest Italian suit I could find. <laughs> because let me tell you something. When Joseph went before Pharaoh, he changed his raiment. People see things more than they hear things. So I put on, bless God, my finest Italian made suit. Lord, I got I put on that tie that costs more than most suits you buy. I put on them crocodile shoes. I slapped myself up with hairspray. <laughs> I said, take me to Wichita. I walked in and Mr. Duplantis, yes, how you doing? He said, can we help you? I said, possibly. Now, I mean, I'm a very truthful man. I don't care what people think. I said, I was in my plane and the Spirit of God told me to come over here. The man went, oh, he did? <laughs> I could see it in his mind. I'm glad he didn't say go to Gulfstream, praise God. You know, you, I said, the Spirit of God come over here and I want to look at your citation line and your citation seven line and your ultra line. Yes, sir, which one are you thinking about getting? I said, I don't know yet, but I don't know when to see it. I said, how much does citation 10 cost? He said, green. I learned that was a different thing. Green means no interior. You know what I mean? You know why? Because it takes green to put interior in it. <laughs> he said, well, if you want all the avionics, everything. I said, yeah, the whole ball of wax. He said, $16 million. I said, sound good. What about Citation 7? Well, about nine. Depending on what you do. You can have some different avionics. You know, it, man, it's apples and oranges out there, man. I said, okay. I went through the whole Citation 10 line. I said, how far was this go? He says, the fastest plane gave me all the stats. I looked at it. See, I had to get faith in my head. I had faith in my heart to believe for something like that, but not in my head. I had to see it. See, I, I, had, I was like Joshua. Let's go walk across this stuff. I told us to Creflo. You know what he told me just yesterday? I'm going over there myself. I said, you walk over there. 
So I walked all the way down that Citation 10 line. They told me what plane belonged to what most major corporations were buying these things. Plus, there was three of them coming out. They just washed and cleaned up. That's what they're going to present. They put it in a glass hanger. They present it to you. I'm telling you. They took me to lunch and dinner. I, I said, and so he looked at me. He says, uh, most people, when they buy a plane, they have a line of credit. And I use the Copeland statement. I said, I have a letter of Philippians. <laughs> now, this man goes, must be, must be a bank in New Orleans or something. <laughs> the, Philipp- the Philippian bank. I, I didn't need to explain that to him, but I believe that. As I walked down, the Lord said, well, would you like to choose one? I said, you're the one that wants me to go all over the place. I'm satisfied what I got. But I told you I'd obey you. What do you want? He said, that one. He said, now get it in your head. I didn't want to go. I'm satisfied, ladies and gentlemen. I didn't want to. Then I looked around. I went through the whole ball of whack and seen how they can, how they, it's amazing the technology of a plane, how they put that thing together. I mean, it's really amazing the engineering that every part has a serial number on it. Every nut and bolt is in certain, it's amazing what they do. I mean, it's something to see. So I came out and he said, Mr. Duplantis, we really sure enjoy you. And Jack, my pilot said, boy, it looked like you got this in your sights. I said, I got it in the crosshairs, Jack. It's mine. Got it in my head now. Now, one barricade, $16 million. No problem, because I didn't have the money to buy the first jet I had. Wasn't a problem to God. Now I got it. So I said, excuse me, I want to pick my interior. (laughs) Yes, sir. I went up to that interior place. Mac, you ought to see what they got up there. He said, what type of wood you like? I said, crotch mahogany. He said, oh, you know something about wood. I said, yes, sir. I said, can you put crotch mahogany in a plane? Yes, sir, but that's more expensive. I said, I thought so. Let me look at it. I looked at it. I picked fabric. i had done everything. He said, you got good taste. I said, you ought to see my wife. <laughs> that's what I said. I agree. I believe that. I said, you ain't seen nothing. You seen my wife. And Jack, my father said, it's just true. <laughs> I got it all set up. Then I asked them to leave. I said, would y'all excuse me just for a few minutes? And I was in the mock room, the mock-up room where they have the cabins, the 10, 7, the Ultra, the uh, Citation Jet. And I sat down. And I said, Lord, I've done all you asked me to do. He said, you like these planes? I said, yes. <laughs> yes, I, I, sh- I cannot tell a lie. <laughs> I like that one over there. That'll get me across the pond, God. He said, now we got something to believe, don't we? I said, yes. He said, go inside of it. I went in that mock-up. I went in the luggage compartment. I look because I like my suit. I don't like this. I don't want my pants wrinkled. I got to iron that thing. It's hard to do that sometimes. I saw that stuff. He says, okay. You got it in your head now? Yeah. He said, call the people back in. I called them back in. I said, I want to thank you. They said, you are really a nice man. I said, thank you. I said, we will be calling you concerning ordering one of these. If I order one, when can I get this? He said, well, right now, But the earliest would be 99, April of 99, if you wanted 10. He says, seven, we just started up the seven line. You might could get that at the, uh, about mid-98. I said, I'll be calling. I said, I'm thinking seriously about it. He said, we would sure love for you to continue the Cessna reputation. Now, this is the president of Cessna and the uh, salesman or whoever it is. I said, sir, I said, corporations buying new planes. I'm a preacher. And he looked at my suit. He said, that's a nice suit. I said, that's a nice plane. You want to trade? (laughs) I'll give you this suit today. He laughed. I laughed. I said, I'll be seeing you. He said, I don't doubt it. Zachworth. I said, you 
You got it. It's in the crosshairs. It's coming down. And as I walked out, the Lord said, friends, friends. I said, friends. He said, Kenneth, Jerry. That's right. Friends, you're here. I said, how would you like to get three of them ordered at one time? The Lord said, four. I said, four. He said, you play golf? I said, no, 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 we, no, no, you don't understand. <laughs> so I looked across that, and I saw yours too. And I saw yours, and I saw Creflo's. I saw it, Jerry. It's ours. So I said, give me enough. I'll buy them all and give them to them. I don't care. Made me no difference. What's money but a tool? That's it. And I went. I said, take me over to that hangar right there where they're coming out. I said, open the doors. And I saw it. I saw her planes coming out. <laughs> Just coming out. I said, God, if we had the money today, we couldn't get it to 99. He said, I can, make, I can have you have these planes tomorrow. All you got to do is get the slot. Ain't no problem. When I get to work on something, son, I can do it. Brother, I left Cessna with that thing in my head. I'm still totally exasperated over the plane I had. Don't misunderstand me. But it's a tool to preach the gospel. And I don't mean this in an arrogant sense, but I see your joys in faith. And I see your joys in faith. And Creflo's not here. I see you his. We've been talking about this stuff. It's ours. And one day, you see how the blue angels do this? One day you're going to see us go, Ooh. and ain't nobody going to tell us to get out the way so an aircraft can pass us. Because that's the fastest thing out there. We're going to do it. It's ours. I got it here, and I got it here. What are you saying? I'm saying my next statement. Learning to let go is one of life's hardest lessons. I had to let go of that jet I got. I said, I can. It's wonderful. I love this thing. Let go. Jesus' ultimate act of faith was not in coming to the earth, but in leaving it. I thought the most ultimate act of faith was Jesus coming, was Jesus leaving. Turn with me to John 16. Watch this. Don't kick the donkey. Look at St. John 16. Verse 7, nevertheless, I tell you the truth. It is expedient for you that I go away. For if I go not away, the comforter. What is Jesus? The comforter? No, he's the counselor. The Holy Spirit is the comforter. Jesus is the counselor. They're working, they, they're working together. He says, it's expedient I go away. Because, see, I can counsel you, Peter, James, and John. I can get you there. But you need a comforter to go where you're going. If I go, I go away, the comforter will not come unto you. But if I depart, I will send him unto you. Jesus' ultimate act of faith was not in him coming to the earth, but in leaving it. I've been married to Kathy 27 years this year. I've traveled most of it. I think three years of my life, I worked a normal job. I'm talking about it as an adult. Gone all the time, whether when I was a sinner in, 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 the, in the rock field and as a minister, as an evangelist. I have never looked to the left or the right. My focus, see, if you eliminate, if you focus on your priority, you eliminate confusion. Because you know where you're going. Because God said it. It's Rhema. He, ain't gonna, he can't change Rhema. He said it. So I focus. And Jesus said, I, I don't, I'm his body. Some people call us his bride. He don't want to leave us. He ain't had his honeymoon yet. He just got us. And there's times I don't want to leave, Kathy. But Jody, my daughter, had to live a normal life. And I said, God, cause this child to understand my calling. And she'd tell me, go get him saved, Dad. It was great. She's 25 today. I learned something from her. I learned something from people. I learned things. I watch people. I love the way Vicki Burke sits on a motorcycle. She's got attitude. She looked good, man. 
She don't sit like, she leans over and says, take this baby home, Dennis. She got attitude, man. I like it. It looked good. Dennis is saying, come on, mama. Come on, mama. We're going. Whoa. And she tell Dennis to park that bike. He swing in and park that bike. <laughs> I'm off this bike. Okay. He, he says, Vicky wants off. You don't mess with people with attitude. <laughs> it's a good attitude. I like the way she sits on that bike. She commands presence. I like that. I learned from that. You walk in a place with attitude, partner. I'm not talking arrogance and egotistical trash. I'm talking about when you are confident of yourself. You're looking at a very confident man. God, I love me. <laughs> Does that shock you? It shouldn't. Because you see, God don't think of much of a man that don't think much of himself. In South Africa, I was driving in the morning service, and I was just praying in my spirit. And I said, God, I want to let you know something. He said, what? I said, I can't live without you. I can't exist without you. And I thought he was going to say, that's nice, Jesse. Thank you. He said, Jesse, let me tell you something. I can't live without you. I tried, Jesse. I tried to live without man. I created cherubims and seraphims and archangels and other angels. I created wealth that the world has never seen. I created universe and planets and everything. But it wasn't my best. But when I created you, when I created man, I did my best. That's why angels stand in amazement because you are God's best. Don't never let anybody tell you you're not worthy. You're the best God can think and the best God can make. You are what he is. you made in his image. That blessed me. He said, look around here. There's nothing that hadn't been created that wasn't created for you. And I saw this tree with purple flowers. I'm starting to notice flowers because of Carolyn Savelle. I never noticed flowers before. But she can name them flowers, panthers, and I don't know what them things are called. <laughs> what they call them? I don't know. Jerry knows them. I don't know them naming them things. You got to speak in tongues. They have the name them. And I saw this tree, and I said, "Look at this beautiful tree." Because I know Carolyn would say, "I want that in my yard," because she likes plants and flowers. The Lord said, "You see, see that tree? To you, you passing by that tree." He said, "But 20 years ago, I commanded that seed to grow." Because I knew Jesse the planters was coming down this road in November of 1996 and it would be pleasing to his eyes when he looked upon it. I said, God, help me. What hadn't been created for you? Everything. You're his best. And you're the only people he ever gave dominion to name everything he created. Adam, name it. And whatever you name it, I'll keep it for eternity. Whew. That's why I believe in naming your seed. You ever know somebody, a baby, when it's born, it owns nothing. Naked as a jaybird, owns nothing until you name it. When you put your name on that baby, that baby owns your clothes and your closet, your car and your garage and your house. <laughs> if you and your husband die, the United States government would hold all your assets until that baby's a full grown age to handle that. You know why? Because you named it. But if you don't name that child, it is illegitimate. And that's the problem with people not receiving the 30, 60, and the 104 because their giving has been illegitimate. They don't know what they're sowing. And when you're illegitimate, you own nothing. You know you're nothing. But you put a name on it. And everything in there belongs to that child. You got to learn to let go. When you've done all you can do, the only thing left to do is let go. Jesus did all he could do. He had to let go. Let your faith work. That's, can you hear Jesus struggling? If this cup come past for me, if I, whoa, man, I don't want to leave. You got to go, Jesus. You got to go. You got to go. If Jesus tarries and I grow old, I, I pray that I'm not the donkey that still tries to run with the herd. I got enough sense to know, Lord, let me have enough sense that when it's my time, I can do what's right if you tarry. But according to Brother Caps, I ain't got to worry about that. And I believe him. I believe him. I don't believe what you said. Yes, there was any speculation. I believe it was scriptural authority. Now, y'all want to stay in this tribulation? Enjoy yourself.
I ain't going to say that. No, I can't say that. <laughs> Don't kick the donkey. Jesus spent a lifetime of preparation and three years of implementation. Ministry is not going to last as long as you think it is. You will spend a lifetime preparing and a short time implementing. But in that short time, you can touch a world. Be wise and learn when to let go. Indiana Jones, the quest of the Holy Grail, the movie, everything to get to that cup. Earthquake shaking, everything's going down. One girl drops in a hole, she's gone. His daddy had been calling him Junior. He hates it. But he loves archaeology. And he reaches for the grail, but he can't quite get it. And he says, Dad, I, I, I'll get it. And his father says, Indiana, let it go. Because no man, you can't touch that. Because the knight says it can't go beyond this perimeter. He had to learn to let it go. We have to learn to let it go. We've done all we know to do. It's time to let our faith do the rest. You see, it's expedient that I go away. His ultimate act of faith was not in coming, but in leaving. Number three. When Jesus was asked which law was the most important, next thing you need to do in not kicking the donkey is boil it down. They're trying to trap him. What's the greatest of the commandments? That's Mark 12, verse 30, I believe it is. Jesus condensed hundreds of laws, writings, and theories down into one sentence. Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, with all thy mind, and with all thy strength. Mark 12, 30. He boiled it down. Quit complicating issues. Boil it down. When people ask me, do you believe Jesus died spiritually? Do you believe and once saved, always saved? What is your doctrinal thinking concerning baptism? I boil it down. Do you pay to you? Do we have to pay tithe? No, you don't have to. You get to. Can't you understand that God's not trying to get, in so, trying to get something from you? He's trying to get something to you. Man said, why do you pay tithe? I said, it ain't because of Malachi 3.10. Because of Malachi 3.11. 311's for me. 310's for him. <laughs> what this 311 says? He rebukes the devour for my sake. I ain't got to pray over my money. My God, the devil tries to touch it. God goes, get your hand off of Jesse's money. He's a tither. I rebuke you for his sake, not my sake. Now listen, if you believe in a hundredfold return, God said you can keep 90. All I want is 10. But if you give me the 10, I'll give you a hundredfold on the 10. So now you can keep the 90 and a hundredfold on the 10. Now you got a hundred ninety-fold. That's a good deal. <laughs> it only could take a Jew to think that. That's smart business. I'm trying to get you something to you instead of something from you. I'll give you a hundredfold on your tithe. So now, on your 10%, that's a hundred. And you keep the 90 what you made. That's 190, my God. Plus, I'll rebuke the devourer for your sake while you're sleeping, while you're up, while you're... Where are you going? And then you got this dumb statement. Is tithing in the New Testament? Don't, don't be Balaam's donkey. Come on. Listen to what I'm saying here. Boil it down. When you understand love and faith in God, you will save yourself years of doubt, confusion, and misplaced energy. How many times we have exhausted ourselves with confusion and misplaced energy? Oh, man. Boil it down. Just simply boil it down. Do you love God? Yeah, do what he says. What did he say? Go read it. Do what he says. Obey it. That's all he asks you to do. It's like tithing in that, in that garden. You can have all these trees. I just like to have one tree. Can I have this tree? You can eat from the whole forest, man. Just let me have this tree. And what did we want? His tree. Number four. Leaders must be willing to take a risk with their public image. Don't kick the donkey. See, you've got to be willing to take a risk with your public image. You've got to understand, there's nine characters in the Bible that the world would not accept 
One was a deluded engineer. You talk about a complete fool, a deluded engineer. Noah built an ark in a desert. That's a deluded engineer. That man's elevator did not go all the way up. You don't build an ark in a desert. A magician. They call Moses a magician because he turned water into blood. They'd call him today, ah, he's just a magician. A waiter. A waiter. A man named Nehemiah was a cupbearer to a king and got things done. Just simple waiter. You want one real strong? A nudist. <laughs> Isaiah laid naked for three years. A nudist. <laughs> Trying to get the gospel over to some of these idiots and they wouldn't listen. So he said, if I get naked, maybe they'll get the point. <laughs> Now, to us, we'd call him a nudist. Three years. Would you lay on the road for three years naked? <laughs> to the world, that's what he was. But to God, that was God's vehicle. Isaiah, take your clothes off and lay down for three years naked as a jaybird. <laughs> oh, come on, God. He told one guy, I want you to eat some dung. Now, listen, this is as far as I'm going here. <laughs> listen, man, you got to get graphic sometime. Belch. Snot. I like that. <laughs> Graphic. Because they can only hear the voice of an ass. God's trying to let you hear his voice. But he's got to use a lower form of life to make you see something. So he says, get naked. Get naked? I'm saved. I don't care. Get naked. A beggar. Prosperous prophet going to beg a widow for food. Call Elijah. My God, you can call fire down from heaven. Can't you call a steak up on the plate? <laughs> what you want to steal that woman's pancake for? What's the matter with you? <laughs> beggar. How about a lunatic? David acted like a complete insane fool to get away from his captors. Spit coming down his beard. David acted insane to escape his captors. Lunatic. A harem girl. What would you do? Somebody in your church was a harem girl. Esther. <sighs> Made her way to the top of the king's list. How about an improper woman having children, getting pregnant out of marriage? Mary. This is what the world would think. Pregnant before she's married. Hmm. Don't tell me an angel of the Lord came down there and said, you're going to conceive. What's his name? Harry? <laughs> We'd call that an improper woman. The key to it all, a blasphemer, Jesus, claimed to be equal with God. But they were willing to take a risk with their public image. Don't kick the donkey. Are you hearing me? That's what the world would think. You want one? You want a perfect example? Here's a man who comes into a bank and says, I want y'all to lend me millions of dollars. I got a thought. A mouse, a fairy, <laughs> my God, <laughs> and seven dwarves. <laughs> what? We want you to give us some money. I, I got this. I got this idea. And Roy Disney said, Walt, you crazy. You ain't going to get no money with a mouse, a fairy, and seven dwarves. What's the matter with you? And Walt Disney had to go beyond, behind his own brother's back and meet with engineers. He wouldn't give him the money. He controlled the money. I got a mouse. I got a fairy. And I got seven dwarves. <laughs> And I'm going to build a complex that's going to shock the world. Walt Disney. 
but he ain't worth nothing. He's got a dishonorable discharge. Does he? Yeah, look on his wall back there. But he had a thought. He was willing to risk his public image because nobody could understand him. He's not here today, but the mouse is. <laughs> the fairy is. And the seven dwarfs are still here. And you run your kids down there. He had to hide behind his brother's back to come up with the idea of Epcot. They said, you sunk enough money in mouse, fairies, and dwarves. Don't do no more. But not Walt. He's a thinker. He came up with Epcot. Disneyland. Disney World. Euro Disney. And they even turned down Michael Eisner. He can't run a company. And he increased the stock about 400%. Why? Because he was willing to take a risk with his public image. Don't kick the donkey. Stay in the vehicle. If it ain't working, get off and see where the angel in the road is. Number five, identify, articulate, and summarize your vision. Make it plain. And it will motivate others to action. Habakkuk, to, to, Habakkuk, however you want to say it. Make the vision plain. Now don't sit down with blueprints and lines because most people ain't going to understand that. Be bright. Be brief. Be gone. Be bright. Be brief. Be gone. Go. Because if you get into the complex issues of this thing, they ain't going to understand it. So be bright. Be brief. Be gone. Summarize. Articulate. Identify. It mo motivates others to action. I said it last year. I'll say it again. When I talk to my staff, I do not hesitate. Why? If you hesitate in this pulpit, you produce confusion in those pews. You can't hesitate. You can't rock. Now, you can rock and do this around your friends because they with you. They understand you, but you can't do it. What would you What would have happened? When the Wall Street dropped 500 points and Reagan would have thrown his hand up and said, oh, man, what are we going to do? We'd have had another depression on our hand. Panic. He said, no problem. We'll be back tomorrow. What would have happened if this nation, if Delano Roosevelt in his organizational address, if he wouldn't have said this, all we have to fear is fear itself. Come on. He pulled this nation up by a strap. Let's go. Move. And of course, he tried to change the Supreme Court, did some things and things of that nature. But what I'm saying, come on. He's a leader. You go, you accomplish. God says you can handle it. But don't spend all your life beating your donkey. Jesus never kicked his. Never let it be said he could hear the words of an angel. He couldn't hear the words of an angel. He could only hear the words of an ass. Don't kick the donkey. You're God's best. You are the executive branch of God's government. The apostle, prophet, evangelist, pastor, teacher. You are all of these things. When you understand what God is saying. And I close with this. Sometimes you think you're hearing. But you're hearing. You think you're hearing right. And my good old friend Ernest Boudreaux. Decided to go to Paris. He said, I'm a Cajun. Man, I'm going to go down there and cross that big pond, find out what them real Frenchmen do. So he got on the plane to fly over. He said, my name is Ernest Boudreaux. I'm going to Gay Paris. And the lady said, Mr. Boudreaux, I know you're a Cajun because we only allow one per flight. <laughs> and <laughs> your French is different from the Paris French and we have a tape and it's on channel 12 and if you listen to it it will help you to know the difference in the Cajun French and in the Paris French like in Paris you would say comment allez-vous which means how you feel it. You get down to the bayou of South Louisiana, Pont-de-Chain, Chauvin, Cocodri, Montecou, Grand Chenier, Little Chenier, 
à Abbeville, Lafayette. You say, come on, c'est va. When you tell somebody to come, you say, yeah, NYC, bug. Or brought yourself over here right now. <laughs> so he said, ma'am, what channel is that on? She says, on 12. Un, deux, trois, quatre, six, 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 huit, neuf, dix. I only went to 10. How do I get to 12? <laughs> so she put it on. He put his earphones on. He listened. After a while, he said, ma'am, I didn't quite. Can you make it louder? Because I want to make sure I got this right. She said, yes, you just hit that volume button. Boom, he hit it. Boy, I mean, it got up loud. She said, can you hear? Oh, oh, I got it, I got it, yeah. Oh, man, I'm going to be good when I get down there. Oh, I can't wait. Nine hours later, they land in Paris. Ernest Boudreau get off the plane. He looked at this French lady. She said, you Mr. Ernest Boudreau? He said, me, yeah, sure, how you doing? Oh, can I call you, Shah? Oh, okay. She said, comment talez vous He went, <laughs> The boy had been listening to Static for nine hours. <laughs> <laughs> That's misplaced energy. <laughs> Don't kick the donkey. I showed my notes to the Marty, and she said, when did you get that sermon? I said, Tuesday. I was in my office. No, Monday. And I said, Lord, what will I preach to these people? And I heard this old rock song, I'm your vehicle, baby. I take you anywhere you want to go. Remember that old song? Y'all been saved all your life? <laughs> The old, old drug addict dentist know that song. <laughs> yeah. When I read that word in that Bible in 20, I said, man, what else is in this Bible? Let me look. I just couldn't believe God could say what he says, but he does. You have a vehicle. Be proud of it. You're God's best and you're the only one in the world who can do it. <laughs>